Welcome to Voices and Views. This is Mark Matheson, and my first guest is Rod Coronado. He is a indigenous animal and wolf advocate. He's from West Michigan. So welcome, Rod. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on the show. All right. So you're indigenous. So what tribe do you belong to? One of the northern tribes? Uh, no, I'm a southern boy. I come from Arizona, and our, our tribe, the Pascoyaki tribe, is native to what is now northern Mexico and southern Arizona. We have a reservation on the Mexico side of 1.2 million acres, and we have our reservation in Arizona as well, and that's that's where I come from, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, far from where I am now, so not really active in the culture as much as I used to be, but I'm very much supportive of indigenous sovereignty and, and issues where indigenous people are, uh, uh, you know, opposed to policies such as the wolf hunt, and, and that's that's a big part of why I've gotten involved in this issue is not only because of its environmental reasons, but also because of its uh, cultural significance to, to different various tribes that are opposed to the hunting of wolves for sport. Now, I find the, the cultural um, histories of, of involvement with animals quite interesting. You know, mm. me, me coming from a, a European Christian uh, heritage, they hate wolves. They really do, and uh, and yet to every tribe that I've ever uh, studied into, uh, wolf that was one of their brothers. So yeah, that's uh, that's the opinion of the Anishinaabe people of the Great Lakes region where I live currently. Um, they call wolf Mayingan, which means brother, and uh, they have a creation story uh, whereby the wolf traveled with the first original man throughout the homeland, naming all the plants and animals, and, and following that that uh, companionship, they, they parted their different ways, and of course I'm paraphrasing things a lot here, but uh, essentially the story was left with the, with the instruction that whatever befalls the wolf will befall the people, the Anishinaabe, and so they've always seen, they saw the eradication of the wolf at the turn of the century as a very similar situation as what they had faced, and and then they, the native people saw the return of the wolf as a, a sign of, of good things to come and change and hope for new beginnings and new generations, and so all that was good. But in the last few years that they've started hunting the wolves in the Great Lakes area, the tribes have been very upset because they see, you know, what's happening to the wolf uh, again being very similar to what's happened to Native people in the past, and so there's a lot of correlation there, and and this isn't an issue just about hunting. It's not an issue just about the wolf. It's about it's about how we see the world, how we see other beings that we share the world with, how we see ourselves in that world, and and uh, how we relate to not only wolves and other animals, but ultimately how we relate to each other. A lot of anthropologists believe that human and wolf evolution coincided, whereby there was a lot of reciprocity in that wolves possibly learned how to hunt from following people and picking up scraps, or people possibly learned how to survive by following wolves and picking up scraps. But there was very, there was a lot of symbiotic uh, relationship between early man and wolf, and I think that that's the foundation for a lot of indigenous people's perspectives on wolves. And, and those are the issues that I'd like people to explore beyond just killing the wolf or, or, or hearing that we're opposed to the wolf hunt. You know, we'd like people to to recognize that, you know, that there are other cultures and other people who see animals a different way, and, and, and maybe our public policy should reflect that diversity of opinion, and maybe we shouldn't gear wildlife and public policies only towards serving the interests of a few rather than the majority of people who are opposed to the hunting of wolves. Yeah, well, I, I find that uh, the many of the most vocal uh, opponents to wolves are those that, for whatever reason, decided to raise their cattle and sheep up into their territory. So that's... Yeah, that's often an issue that's overlooked is, is that, you know, that the places where these depredations take place, because, yeah, wolves do, you know, take down an occasional cow and sheep and dog, and but, but you're right, you know, these animals are being 
you know, freely grazed on largely public lands, you know, and they're given more rights to that land than the native wildlife that belongs to everybody. And that doesn't seem fair. You know, it seems like it's, you know, there's, there's very specific federal laws about multiple use on public lands and how no one person's use should, should infringe upon somebody else's. And, and yet these hunts, you know, really drastically impact uh, other people's ability to appreciate nature and appreciate wolves. I mean, you know, the, the um, model in Yellowstone has been an excellent example of what type of economy can be built off of simply viewing wildlife. And, and beyond what you feel about the cultural attitudes that people have about wolves, you can't ignore the fact that there's also an economic boom associated with with the return of the wolf to the Yellowstone ecosystem, and that can't be ignored either. So, so yeah, there's a lot of issues that, that I think come up when you start addressing those old attitudes that, that still exist about, you know, predators and wolves, especially in coyotes. And, and I think that our society as a whole is changing, and people are viewing animals and nature differently and recognizing the value that they serve and the ecosystem. And, and I just don't think that those attitudes are being reflected yet in, in public agencies. And so that's something that we hope to change over time. And this is where it starts for us. It starts by us monitoring public activities on public lands, by going out and seeing what's going on. We hear about it. We, you know, we can see what wolf haters post on their Facebook sites about wolves, but, but really we want to get out there and see for ourselves. We want to document what's being done to our public lands and, and hopefully, you know, in this information age, you know, use that evidence to, to inspire people to become more politically active and, and put pressure on their legislatures and Governor Bullock and other people to, to, uh, to protect the wolf rather than just, you know, return to the policies of eradication. Yeah. Uh, you were recently in Montana regarding uh, the opening of uh, the wolf hunt here. Tell us a little bit about that, please. Well, we came out to Montana because we feel that the hunting of wolves uh, immediately outside of the boundaries of the park, Yellowstone National Park, is wrong. Uh, we have been reviewing the information from the last three years, two or three years of since there's been recreational hunting of wolves, and we've seen and we've heard about the impacts that the killing of, of biologically significant animals from Yellowstone wolf herds is having on, on ongoing research that is, for the first time, revealing the, the, the relationship that wolves have in a, in a healthy ecosystem, because, as your listeners might know, uh, the wolves are one of the last uh, missing links of the ecosystem in, in Yellowstone that had not returned, and since their return, you know, there's been much uh, uh, spoken as to the impact on the environment, the positive impacts of the environment that wolves have had in the, in the, the uh, tropic cascade, the, the, the connected effect of, of how they relate to not only their prey, but also their, the, the, the animals that are directly related to the prey, the plants and animals in their community. Um, I was speaking with uh, Tom earlier about the relationship that the elk now have where they're not as freely grazing in, in open, low-lying areas where they were more vulnerable to predators. Because now that their, their native predator has returned, we're seeing those elk's behavior modifying, and that modification is, is allowing aspens and willows to grow in places where they used to grow but haven't been because they've been overgrazed by elk. and. And that, that means that, you know, there's more beavers in the area, and that means that there's more, uh, you know, healthier river ecosystems because more shoreline uh, vegetation is allowed to grow as well. And so there's all these connections that we had heard about before we came to Montana, so we wanted to see for ourselves. And we also wanted to come into the area where we knew that people were paying, um, you know, upwards of four or five, six thousand dollars to to hunt trophy elk and and also kill wolves, and so we wanted to uh, document that because we believe that the majority of the American public is opposed to such policies, and we believe that if they see what is happening on their public lands, that they will be outraged enough to get active to oppose it. And, uh, you know, we live in an information age now, and social media, and 
you know, you, you post a video online of, of somebody killing a wolf, and uh, it leads a lot of people to become, you know, more active in opposing such things. So that's that's what we're doing. Um, you know, our interactions in Montana, we're, we're, we're very respectful and civil with everybody we interacted with. You know, we're talking to, you know, the guides and outfitters that we were targeting who, who bring out out-of-state hunters, you know, for thousands of dollars to kill elk and wolves. You know, we had good relationships with them, with the National Park Service backcountry rangers who are out there patrolling the same area of the, of the park, ensuring that hunters aren't violating the boundary by hunting within the park. We had good relationships with them, but largely because we're doing the same job that they're doing. You know, we just want to make sure that people are not illegally hunting and and uh, chasing animals into the park and and uh, also, I think that they saw us as people that are concerned about the environment and the public lands, and, and, and so much so that we're willing to go out there ourselves in our own time and money and, and see what's going on. And, and I think that, you know, that's the kind of uh, activism that's really needed now. Um, so that's, that's where it started for us, is in Montana. And, and of course, we, we're not, we can't just work on environmental issues and, and, and can contain ourselves to the boundaries of, a, of one state. You know, the wolf doesn't know political boundaries and, and loose freely between all the Rocky Mountain states, you know. And um, I had a, a researcher, a wolf researcher, tell me about a Yellowstone wolf that showed up in South Dakota a couple months ago. Hmm. And, um, you know, that's what these animals do. They travel large areas of land and cross many state boundaries. And and so uh, our... our Aim is to is to modify wolf management policies, not just in Montana, but in, in every state where states have taken over authority of wolves from the federal government. And and we've started in Montana, but we're going to continue in Wisconsin, where the wolf hunt starts in about uh, one week, actually. And uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. Now you live in Michigan, and Michigan has recently uh, began. A rather strange uh, hunting season. Tell us about that, please. Well, Michigan uh, is one of the states with the most conservative wolf harvest. Last year, the 2013 hunting season was the first year in in, in almost 60 years that wolves were legally hunted in Michigan, and uh, the quota was set pretty low at about 48 animals, and only about 23 were killed. Um, the big difference with the hunting season in Michigan is, is that no trapping is allowed. And in states such as Montana and Idaho and Wisconsin and Minnesota, upwards of 70 to 80 percent of all wolves killed are killed with, with traps, primarily steel jaw traps with sometimes wire snares. Uh, so while we're encouraged that Michigan does not have a trapping season, you know, I've been to Natural Resources Commission meetings here where they've spoken of, of potentially introducing a trapping season. And uh, where it's come to right now with Michigan, because we are not in, we're not going to see a hunt in, in the 2014 season, and that's largely because there's three different uh, citizen-led initiatives that have made it to the ballot that pertain to the hunting of wolves. Uh, one of the initiatives is, is supportive of the hunt, two are opposed and uh, the state is uh, taking a, the, the proactive position of stepping back and allowing the voters to express their, their opinion on the issue. And, and I'm hoping that they will, you know, follow suit. And if the majority of the voters are opposed to the hunt, I hope that the state reflects that and, and that we don't see any more hunting of wolves ever again here. Well, that would be nice. Um, on your website, I saw something about a... I thought it was Michigan. I could be wrong about uh, allowing dogs to in the hunt. That's where we're going right now to, to Wisconsin. Wisconsin is the only state in the nation that allows the hunting of wolves with hounds. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we're headed there next week is because there is a strong hound hunting culture in Wisconsin. It's not just wolves that are hunted with hounds. It's coyotes, it's bears, it's raccoons. Bobcats and and of course these houndsmen don't only uh, impact wolves during the wolf hunting season, but during the summer months as well when wolves are taking their new pups to rendezvous sites, which are 
locations away from the den where they can begin to learn how to hunt. Uh, these wolves are vulnerable at this time, these pups. And this is, coincides with the training season for hunting hounds. And so beginning in July 1st in Wisconsin, hunters can freely run their hounds through the woods, chasing bears, chasing coyotes, chasing any wild animals. And they're not allowed to legally kill those animals, but they can run them, they can tree them. And in the process of doing this, they trespass through wolf territory, and these wolves are defending their families and, and killing the, these, these hunting hounds. Um, this has happened 18 times this summer. 18 wolves or 18 uh, hunting dogs have been killed, and six have been injured. And uh, these, uh, um, the state actually pays hound hunters, uh, reimburses them for their losses. So there's no real incentive for these hunters to not run their hounds through the woods. Instead, they just simply replace them. They get paid, you know, upwards of four thousand dollars a hound that's killed by wolves. And and not only that, but you know, this is also fueling more anti-wolf sentiment because. These houndsmen are the first people to post their pictures online of their dogs that have been torn up by wolves and, you know, trying to inflame people's attitudes against the wolf. And, and this is all, you know, to most outsiders, you know, just what happens when you run, you know, your dogs in an area where there's wild dogs is that they're, you're putting your dog at risk. It should be the responsibility of that pet owner, that dog owner, to not allow their dogs into wolf territory during the summer months when, when, Wolves are exceptionally protective of their families. And, and so that happens in Wisconsin. Last year was the first year that they legally were able to hunt wolves with hounds, and they killed 35 animals uh, of the 150 quota that they had. And, and this year they're going to be out there again. So we're going to be out there trying to highlight that. And, and every bit as much as the reasons why we're opposed to the Yellowstone wolf hunt and the proximity of the hunt to the park also, we're opposed to the hunting of, of wolves with hounds because we just don't feel it's sport, don't feel it's hunting. It's essentially, you know, allowing dogs to chase wildlife, and uh, um, most states that's illegal. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, apologize for mixing up Wisconsin and Michigan on the, that no, point. It's so many states that are hunting wolves now; it's easy to do. Yeah, but uh, you know, I grew up in Minnesota, and I can remember. You know, back in the 60s, going up to the St. Croix uh, uh, State Park and uh, going deer hunting with my dad. And, I mean, those woods were just filled with uh, wolves. And I don't remember people being outraged of competing with the wolves uh, for deer hunting. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, Minnesota was the only state that never true totally lost their wolf population but uh, I, I don't remember it being a big deal back in Minnesota, at least when I was a kid. Yeah, no, I, you are correct. Michigan, Minnesota was the only state that has maintained wolves over the past uh, century, and uh, um, there hasn't been a history of conflict uh, with wolves there. I think that um, you know people have learned to live harmoniously with them, and it's only... Uh, I think, you know, in the last generation or so that sport hunters have gotten really used to the state serving their interest in, in passing policies that reflect their desires. And, and that's been happening in Minnesota, unfortunately, in the last couple of years. With, you know, they have some of the largest hunts uh, of wolves uh, in the Great Lakes areas. And uh, um, the St. Croix area you're talking about, that's exactly where we're going next week because that's, a lot, that's the area where a lot of these wolves are being killed, right? right up against the Minnesota border there. Hmm. So uh, that's something that I think, uh, um, you know, speaks speaks again to that attitude that exists, uh, you know, that, of a lot of people, even people in rural communities who, who have always recognized wolves as being a part of the environment and, and have always been able to, you know, share their, their home with them. Yeah, well, cultural attitudes uh, can change. Um, they've got to change. And uh, what we're what we're learning about wolves in the Yellowstone area and throughout the Rockies is is quite amazing. Uh, the positive benefits that they have uh, brought. Uh, yeah, and I, and I'd like us to find out what those benefits are here in the Great Lakes as well. And before we're able to do that, though, we're having states like Wisconsin who are, you know, pushing down their population 
uh, they conservatively say uh, they're pushing it down 20% annually, but but uh, Richard Thiel, who is one of the principal wolf recovery biologists in Wisconsin, is, is saying that they've fudged the figures and that their population might be declining as high as 40 or 50 percent annually with these hunts. So, you know, it's a real shame that we're missing out on the opportunity to study the impact that the wolf is having on the environment and their prey species and other animals and, and plants because we're starting to learn about that in Yellowstone, and what we're finding out is, I think, instrumental in knowing how we can have a more healthy relationship with, with wildlife. And uh, I wish we could do that here. I wish that we could do that in Michigan and in Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and that we could just, you know, let these wolves be for a few years, you know, if not longer, and let's study them. Let's, let's understand the situation better before we just start allowing hundreds of hunters to roam through the woods you know, with a fifteen dollar tag that allows them to kill any wolf they see. That's just that's not wildlife management to me. That's just that's just blood sports. Yeah, blood sport. I I know I've uh, traveled around uh, northern Idaho quite a bit and the amount of anti wolf signage is you know, just struck me uh, you know, not only you know, statements like "wolves are the are Idaho's number one poacher." Poacher, goodness, that's a legal term. Uh, you know, wolves are hunting for their life. It's it's not a sport to them. And uh, you know, they show pictures yeah, it, of of the wolves snarling rather than, you know, they they could just as well show a, a family of of wolves showing love to each other instead of a snarl, which any of our dogs can do. Yeah, and many people as well. Um, yeah, you know, some of this this language that you hear people use to describe wolves or to speak of wolves, it it, it harkens back to what I remember learning about uh, the Deep South during Jim Crow mm -hmm. and the racism and the attitudes that people had towards African-American citizens. And that same attitude is what I see being reflected in this hatred towards wolves is that, you know, it's, and because a lot of it is coming from people who don't necessarily live close to the wolves, but people whose whose fears are being fed, you know. And it's that same story again of uh, Little Red Riding Hood, you know, the the fierce beast that's trying to to steal away the young, the innocent, you know. And and as you as you mentioned, you know, that's not the case. You know, that's not what predators do. That's that's a concept that was brought over from Europe hundreds of years ago, you know, and that fueled the destruction of, of predator populations in Europe. Those attitudes were brought with Europeans to America, and they were um, they over overcame the attitude that existed previously that saw wolves as an important part of the environment, an important part of people's culture. And uh, it's a tragedy to me that that we're missing out on the opportunity to uh, um, to show the wolf and show the world that we've learned from our mistakes and that we we're not going to you know go back to that way of seeing animals in in a in a demonic way, but, um, you know, and, and you can show any predator in a bad light when they're poised over their kill, you know, the way that they feed their families, you know, and so a lot of these pictures that I see on anti-wolf hunt sites of, of dead deer, of dead dogs that have been killed by wolves, you know, they're, they're using that shocking image to fuel this hatred, and they're not basing their opinions on sound science, or 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 even much knowledge, but just they're using this um, yeah, hate speech. That's the best way I can describe it. Yeah, I remember arguing with a person out here in Montana about uh, you know the value of wolves, the danger of wolves, and and with their argument, I said, uh, you know, you could just you know look at humans are doing the same thing, you know, if in your in your re line of reasoning. So we're we're the predators. We uh, we do a lot of unnecessary killing, and uh, we guard our food supply. You know, are we worse? Yeah, and, are we worse than wolves? And and I think that that's that's part of what a lot of uh, these attitudes are about is because I think some people see that wolves are going after the animals that we also eat, and uh, they're considering you know that. Uh, humans have greater rights to those animals than, than native wildlife, and 
And I think that's a dangerous position to take. Um, it promotes, you know, an unhealthy attitude towards our environment. Um, and uh, using terms like you said that you saw in Idaho, calling a wolf a poacher, you know, when it's just doing something that biologically it's hardwired in its DNA to do. I mean, what we've learned in Michigan is, is uh, I read some archival newspaper accounts of wolves that had gone through an area killing aimlessly as many deer as they could and, and leaving them scattered across the ground. And and what's been learned now is, is that what wolves will do, at least this is what we've learned in the Great Lakes area, is, is that wolves will go in wintertime when wolf deer are more vulnerable. They will kill multiple animals, and they will leave them. And those animals freeze, and they get buried by the snow. And come springtime when there's less prey around and, and and those wolves are more dependent, you know, on having to feed their families. They'll go and they'll, as these animals are thawing, they'll feed off of them, and they'll it'll be frozen food source that they've stored their food for the winter or yeah. for the spring. And so there's yeah. lots of things like that that we haven't even begun to understand. Yeah, I've I've heard uh, you know the same arguments about the indiscriminate killing, but yet if left alone, they will go back and use everything just like we would. If we killed off uh, a whole bunch of chickens and stuck them in a freezer, we'll eventually eat them. So. Yeah, and and I was in you know in Montana in the back country, and the rangers were saying you know that any animal that that dies out there or gut pile left by a hunter, it's like it's it's devoured in a matter of hours. You know, there's there's nothing wasted out there. No, nope. you know, these these animals are not trying to kill more than they need. You know, any time a predator goes after its prey, it's risking its own life, and they're not trying to do that unless they absolutely have to. Right. So if people want to get more information, uh, what is your website and contact information? We Our website is wolfpatrol.org, all one word. And our website, you know, we also have a Facebook page by the same name, Wolf Patrol. And then we also have an email, which is teamwolfpatrol.org. Not team with a N, but team with a M as in Michael. Um, everybody asks us if we are using Teen Wolf, and maybe we should have because that's more popular, but it's actually <laughs> Teen Wolf Patrol. Um, and uh, we're going to be returning to Montana in a few weeks here. Uh, we're going to come back to the Absaruka Beartooth Wilderness area and, and try to patrol and observe the movements of the elk as they leave Yellowstone. Uh, the wolves will probably follow in tow. Uh, feeding off the elk and also feeding off the gut piles left by hunters who are hunting in the fall as well. And, uh, you know, the quotas for the two zones that we're trying to stop right now are just six animals. You know, it's three one, wild, Wolf Management Unit 313 and Wolf Management Unit 316. It's three animals in each zone, just uh, just half a dozen wolves. That's all we're asking that the state rescind uh, the, the hunting of is, you know, we just want to see the wolves around Yellowstone protected first. And we don't think that's too much to ask, and we think that that's reasonable and that, you know, it's not costing anybody their livelihood to allow six wolves to live. Well, that's a good goal. So if anybody's interested, uh, please visit the website and uh, like uh, their Facebook page. And you know, and let us know if anybody would like to come out and join us in the fall patrol, if you would like to host us, if you would like to uh, let us, Stay at your house and shower after you come out of the mountains, or you'd like to drop off a load of groceries at, our, at the trailhead where we can meet you. You know, we'd love to have more support from people in Montana, and and if they want to take a little vacation and come visit us in Wisconsin, have it be a working wolf vacation. We'd love to have have more people join us as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, everybody thank out there. Thank you guys so much for doing the show and having me on it today. Oh, you're very welcome. We've been talking to Rod Coronado. He is uh, an animal and specifically wolf advocate. He's from uh, West Michigan. And uh, he you can learn more about him on his website, the wolfpatrol.org, and his Facebook page. So thank you for joining us, Rod. For voices Have a great and, fall, everybody. For Voices and Views, Mark Matheson. <laughs>